All right, I'm back. This time it is to talk to you about central nervous system depressants and potentially adrenal anesthesia, depending on the length of the video. So we've covered stimulants, we've done some overview, and now we're moving into a discussion on central nervous system depressants. So in this context, we're looking at drugs that do not act selectively, but instead they inhibit the entire central nervous system. So that's essentially what these agents are going to do. They're going to decrease the excitability of the tissue in the central nervous system. There's a lot of drugs that fall under this category, and they're prescribed a ton. Um, <clears throat> They're all going to be sedatives, right? They're all depressants. So if you recall our continuum chart, we saw below the normal or neutral line. Those were signs of depression starting with sedation. So we're going to kind of review some of those terms just so you're familiar with them. But the one point I want to make, and I'm going to make it over and over again, is that all depressants, it doesn't matter which one we're talking about, and the two classes that we're going to focus on are the benzodiazepines and the barbiturates. Um, alcohol also falls in this category, although it's not used clinically, so we're just going to touch on it. Um, all of these agents have the potential to take a patient from hypnosis, or pardon me, from sedation to hypnosis to general anesthesia. It's all going to be dependent on the dose. And that's an important thing to note because that was different with the stimulants. Remember, you can't compare the um, degree of stimulation le with, let's say, an amphetamine and, a, and caffeine. There are very different agents. It doesn't matter if you keep increasing the dose of caffeine. It's going to be really hard, if not impossible, to achieve the same kind of stimulation that you're going to see with, this, with an amphetamine. However, in the context of the central nervous system depressants, that's not the case. They are all dose dependent. So there's some terms I want to outline. One is sedative, one is hypnotic, and the other is um, general anesthesia or general anesthetic. So oftentimes the drugs that fall in the, in the category of central nervous system depressants get called either sedatives or hypnotics or sometimes sedative slash hypnotic. And again, remember, it's because they, any agent can do either or. It just depends on how much you take. So a sedative, by definition, is a drug that's administered at a dose that's going to cause mild drowsiness or sedation um, or, to, or to reduce restlessness or anxiety. And they shouldn't really interfere with someone's overall normal function. I'm going to pause you for a second because I am getting a phone call. Okay. Um, the other class I want to, the, and the next definition I want to give you, pardon me, is um, what a hypnotic is. A hypnotic is a drug that is administered at a dose that causes someone to fall asleep or stay asleep. That's the big one. Um, normally, to get this hypnotic effect, you have to give the dose, the drug, pardon me, at a dose about three to four times larger than that of a sedative. Um, and in the term hypnosis, that encompasses or um, implies, I guess, that the person is able to be awoken. It might not be that easy, but they're able to be aroused from sleep. They're not unconscious. Which brings us to our third definition, which is general anesthesia. General anesthetics are drugs that depress the central nervous system to such a degree that it causes a loss of consciousness. Um, and in addition to being, un being unconscious, and unconscious is also... Um, defined as unarousable sleep. Um, in addition to being unconscious, they also are not going to be able to perceive pain. So the word for drugs that diminish the sensation of pain are called analgesics. So an anesthetic causes both a loss of consciousness and analgesia. And the reason why they cause analgesia is because you can't perceive pain if you're unconscious. So really they're just causing a loss of consciousness. Um, Okay, so these people are unarousable. They're not dead, but they're unarousable, which means it's going to not be easy to, to get them to wake up. All right, so in, I just gave you this kind of, but this is an important distinction. So in this video, we're talking about anesthetics, which are going to cause a loss of consciousness. 
not necessarily analgesia. Analgesics relieve pain without a loss of consciousness. We're going to have a separate video on pain medication in, in later um, down the line a little bit in this unit. All right, so let's look at these depressants. So these, like I said, oftentimes are referred to as sedatives or sedative hypnotics or hypnotics, depending on the objective. I want to run through the big ones we're going to talk about are the barbiturates and the benzodiazepines or the non-barbiturates, which are, um, they're, they act similarly, but they have a different structure. So we'll talk about responses, mechanisms of action, therapeutic uses, side effects, and toxic effects, and special cautions and considerations. One thing to note about the CNS depressants is that they activate the cytochrome P450 family of enzymes, which if you recall, the cytochrome P450 enzymes are responsible for the metabolism of a whole bunch of stuff, including almost all drugs. So central nervous system depressants will change the way we metabolize our drugs, depressants and any other drug that's also potentially being used and metabolized by the cytochrome P450 family of enzymes. So here we go. I'm going to lump them together kind of to talk about them, and then we'll separate them um, when we kind of go through the ins and the outs of them. So the sedative hypnotic agents are the largest, the oldest, and the most studied of all of our CNS drugs. These drugs produce uh, varying degrees of depression depending on the dose, as we said before. Um, <clears throat> they're all they're all gen depressants though, so they're all going to decrease the cellular activity of the central nervous system as well as other organ systems, you know, especially you know outgoing messages. Essentially, is what I'm talking about. The synapse is the site of action, and the classes are the benz barbiturates, the benzodiazepines, alcohol, and I threw um, antihistamines on the list as well because they have a depressant effect for many people and they can interact with the other depressants. So we'll get back to that later. So these drugs are used mostly, they're used a lot for anxiety. These are anti-anxiety drugs. We'll kind of go through anxiety more in a later video. Um, but there's all kinds of types of anxiety, situational anxiety, you know, is due to some kind of life event, usually is temporary. Neurotic anxiety, we call, which isn't really the best term, but it's anxiety for no rational reason. Reason, pardon me. If somebody has neurotic anxiety, the best course of action would be probably some sort of form of psychotherapy and potentially also a drug or maybe just the psychotherapy on its own, but definitely those two in tandem. Okay, another very common use for these drugs are sleep disorders, specifically insomnia, people who have a hard time going to sleep or staying asleep. These are um, drugs are highly abused for this reason. Um, they, the, the research really shows that these drugs should only be used temporarily for the sleep um, disorders. That's not necessarily the way that they are used, but that's the way they were designed and approved for use. Um, so there's different types of actions of these drugs. We have ones that act fast. Those would be more indicated for people who have a hard time falling asleep. And the extended action for those people who go to sleep, but then they wake up. So that might be a longer duration. Um, the problem as we get into the longer duration is that these drugs ca cause what we call a hangover effect. So it makes them feel like they have a hangover. I'll talk about that more when we talk about the side effects. Um, this research does show, however, that the sleep promoting benefit of these drugs really um, the, in terms of the, so like the, the range of which they're actually helpful is about three to 14 days. Anything over 14 days um, have shown to actually be more disruptive to sleep architecture. That's You can do that research if you really wanted to dive into it, but that's my, by my combing over of the research, that's what I've found. Um, and then you can see some on the slide there, there's a few more benzos that are even longer term. Um, you don't need to know those, but I gave you some examples there. <clears throat> 
Uh, another reason to use these drugs potentially are for seizures as an anticonvulsant or an anti-epileptic agent. And I'm going to talk more about epilepsy later as well. Um, when we look at the two, the barbiturates versus the benzodiazepines, the barbiturates have largely been replaced by the benzos because they are safer, not better, but safer. Um, and so for most cases of uh, I should say for all cases of anxiety and sleep disorders, the benzodiazepines are going to be recommended over a barbiturate for that reason. But for epilepsy, it's a little trickier. And, and for epilepsy, we still do see barbiturates used frequently. And again, I'm going to talk more about epilepsy later, so we'll come back to that. But for the most part, we're going to choose benzos over barbiturates. So these drugs are all CNS depressants, and basically how they act is they allow the influx of chloride. So here you see this, they essentially potentiate the action of this neurotransmitter, which is GABA. So GABA is a, um, oops, the button too soon. GABA is a, um, is a inhibitory neurotransmitter. Right? It's our primary inhibitory neurotransmitter. It's the second most abundant neurotransmitter in the central nervous system, and it's inhibitory. So what that means is what GABA does when GABA binds again, 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 it causes a ion channel to open, and the ch channel that opens is a chloride ion channel. And so what happens is chloride, a negatively charged ion, rushes into this cell, making the inside of the cell more negative, which if you remember anything about electrophysiology, Basically, what this is doing is it's hyperpolarizing the cell, making it harder to reach threshold. So that's how it acts as a depressant. It's harder to stimulate these. It's harder to propagate impulses when GABA is around. So the benzos and barbiturates both potentiate the action of GABA, and they do it a little bit differently. You see there's two. There's allosteric binding sites, right? They bind an alternate site than the GABA, and those two sites ultimately are what potentiate the action of GABA. So I want to talk first about the barbiturates. So you can see there that the mechanism of the barbiturates is to enhance the GABA, right? So basically it either enhances the GABA response or it mimics GABA by opening chloride channels in the absence of GABA. In either case, what it's going to do is it's going to increase the inhibition in the central nervous system. That's the depressant effect. So all barbiturates can produce sedation. You can see that sedation, hips, hypnosis, coma, and death. The thing that's most likely to cause death with a barbiturate is respiratory depression, and you can see that on the second um, bullet there, and the respiratory depression is the most common overdose that leads to death. They also induce the cytochrome P450 system, which we just mentioned. So if someone's taking a barbiturate, and we could say a benzodiazepine for the same reason, there's a whole bunch of drugs that are going to interact with that. So it's going to change the way drugs are metabolized. Um, in terms of, let me back up for a minute on respiratory depression. So um, if you recall in the beginning of this conversation about depressants, I said that all depressants, barbiturates, benzodiazepines, and, um, and also alcohol, have the ability to produce sedation, hypnosis, and coma, or general anesthesia. But not all of them have the propensity when used on their own to cause death. Barbiturates are the example, or pardon me, the exception to that, and the reason for that is because they suppress respiration basically by inhibit. They're CNS depressants, so they inhibit. They, there's so much chloride ion influx, if you will, that they actually inhibit the respiratory centers of the brain. So they make the brain less sensitive to changes in um, elevations in carbon dioxide, which is when you expire, right? We expire carbon dioxide. Normally that's our main stimulus for breathing. They inhibit that. And they also block the signals that are um, s stimulating respiration when oxygen levels go down. So that's a big deal, right? First, our first sense, our high, our most acute sensitivity comes to elevation in carbon dioxide and then followed by uh, decreases in oxygen. And, and e e either one of those will trigger or trip the respiratory center to stimulate respiration. But what we've done with barbiturates, potentially with an overdose or a large dose, or, uh, well, oh, uh, I'll come back to that in a minute, is uh, they cut off both of those stimuli. So that's the reason why we see respiratory depression. 
There's a bunch of different barbiturates. They're kind of classified by either their duration of action, whether they're short acting or long acting, meaning they come on fast or they take a longer and, and are eliminated quickly, or they take a longer time to produce an effect, but stick around for longer in the body. Or also the degree of lipid solubility. We're not going to really get too much into that, but remember any drug that is lipid soluble has all access and can get all over the place, including the central nervous system. All right, and, that, and the lipid solubility has a lot to do with the duration of action, but again, it's kind of outside of the context of what we're going to do here. So here's some examples of barbiturates. I'm not going to test you on them individually, but you may be familiar with some of them. Most of them end in AL, which is helpful. So phenobarbital is kind of the classic one. That's the one that we see used still for epilepsy. Um, it's slow acting and it's long acting, so it sticks around all day. Pretty broad spectrum, it's barbiturate. Um, Secobarbital and pentobarbital are intermediate acting, and thiopental is a drug that um, has some utility in anesthesia and it's very short acting. Onset is in seconds and then it gets metabolized quite quickly. So it's in and out within minutes, essentially, given via the IV route. All right, so um, one thing I want to say about barbiturates that I didn't really say here, because we're going to compare and contrast the barbiturates and the benzodiazepines. So one of the things we talk about barbiturates is we say that they're GABA independent, which means that you don't have to have GABA to open chloride channels. The barbiturate can cause that to happen. And the other thing is when you run out of GABA at the synapse, so if they are, let's say, potentiating the action of the GABA that's already there, when you run out of GABA at the synapse with a barbiturate, the chloride channel stays open. That's why they're called GABA independent, which means they open chloride channels independently of the availability of GABA. Benzodiazepines are not going to do that. And because they open chloride channels independently of the availability of GABA, that's why they stay open so long, and that's why we see the respiratory depression. So that's the key distinction between the barbiturates and the benzodiazepines in terms of safety. So benzos are going to bind a specific site, like we saw on the picture. They're going to um, enhance the affinity of GABA for GABA. So essentially what ha that means is you have to have GABA in the synapse in order for the benzo to work. When you run out of the GABA, then the benzo's out, right? It's the chloride channel will close. So while the chloride channel is opening, you're going to see hyperpolarization and inhibition of the central nervous system. But when you run out of GABA, the chloride channel closes and the de depression is stops at that point until you were to add more benzo. So benzos, for that reason, are considered to be safer. They're not better. In terms of clinical utility for anxiety, sleep, seizures potentially, they are equally efficacious, but they're safer because of the fact that when you run out of GABA, that chloride channel will close. So all benzodiazepines are going to reduce anxiety. They're going to produce sedation, right? Um, some of them are going to be used to treat epilepsy as well, and some are used to induce anesthesia. Um, <clears throat> so they have a they have a pretty broad spectrum. They're metabolized in the liver. Um, in in the benzos, it's kind of interesting. They're metabolized in the liver to a more active form. So that is one of the things that makes getting rid of benzodiazepines potentially kind of confusing and difficult. Is that they get kind of metabolized to a more active form, um, and then those active metabolites are eliminated slower than the parent compound, right? So basically, you administer a benzo, it, the parent, it gets metabolized pretty quickly, but the metabolites are going to have a slower elimination. So basically, what I'm trying to say is the benzodiazepines tend to stick around for a while in the body. They have a pretty long duration of action. Physical and psychological dependence can occur with both. We talk, think about it, or we should think about it a little bit more with benzos because they're used so much. These are very commonly prescribed medications. The withdrawal symptoms for both barbiturates and benzos are, are postulated to be the worst of any withdrawal symptoms around. Um, on, the, on the later side of things, they can cause confusion, anxiety, agitation, and restlessness. 
Some people are going to move through these symptoms pretty quickly, you know, days to weeks. Other people, the symptom, the withdrawal symptoms specifically with the benzos will last for months. Um, in some cases, people can't get off of them at all. So here's a little chart. This is more than you need to know, but in case you're curious, I wanted to kind of um, show you that these, so these are the different benzos. Most of them end in AM, so that makes them kind of easy to identify. There's a couple like clonopin, or pardon me, like um, transine and um, librium that are kind of outliers in terms of the naming. But uh, you can see the rest of them, the generic names end with AM. Uh, a lot of them are used a lot. Xanax, I think, is one of the most commonly prescribed. It's also one of the most commonly abused, if you remember from our conversation. Lorazepam, val diazepam, so um, um, alprazolam is Xanax, uh, diazepam is Valium, uh, lorazepam is Ativan, Temazepam is Restoril. Those are ones that you hear a lot. Um, midazolam is Versed. Anyway, they're all used a lot. So these are kind of the indications, and you can see these are the things that we've been talking about, generalized anxiety disorder, right? The A means it's an FDA approved. If it has a O, it's an off-label use, which means it still has some utility, but that's not what it was approved for. So you can see we've got generalized anxiety, we've got panic disorder, more for Xanax and Clonopin, although some people re report it's off-label for Ativan. Um, a whole bunch for sleeping, right? Um, some of them are off-label, most of them are off-label. Uh, seizures, the big seizure ones are um, clonazepam, um, diazepam, and lorazepam in the IV form, specifically for something called um, status epilepticus, which is a seizure that won't, won't, we can't get to cut. We'll talk more about that later. Alcohol withdrawal, they'll use um, benzos, which is sort of interesting because you're kind of substituting a depressant for a depressant. Um, and then you can see for the pre-anesthetic, there's not a whole bunch of a pre-anesthetic. Lorazepam is, again, the one that use IV mostly. And then you can see some other sort of interesting uh, off-label uses. We're getting some traction around the premenstrual dysphoric disorder, which is the new term for PMS. Um, muscle spasms, Valium is used for muscle spasms with some degree of um, uh, frequency. So that's, you don't need to know all that, but I just kind of wanted to see. These are, so these are conditions, anxiety and insomnia, big, lots of people in the population dealing with these issues. So these drugs are used all the time. So all depressants are going to cause people using them to appear kind of dull and apathetic, right? And they're going to show signs similar to alcohol intoxication. This is the same thing, right? That's what alcohol is. It's a central nervous system depressant. So um, they're going to have issues with performance, right? Remember, remember on our continuum chart, we said that D CNS depressants decrease sensory acuity as well as motor activity. So decrease perception and judgment. There's some changes in psychomotor activity. Um, they're oftentimes, oh, if they've taken them for a long time, you might actually see some electroencephalogram EEG uh, changes. The hangover effect I referred to, so it does feel like they have a hangover. The most common symptoms of the hangover effect are dizziness, fatigue, and, and diarrhea. Um, barbiturates are known for this, or slightly less true of the benzodiazepines, but the longer-acting ones, I think for sure, like the ones for the people who are having to take these drugs to stay asleep, they have to take a longer drug, and the hangover effect is more likely to be an issue for them. One of the things that is um, notable for barbiturates only is that people tend to be hypersensitive to pain. So if somebody has pain, giving them a barbiturate would definitely not be the best idea. Um, and also uh, sometimes with surgical procedures, if somebody's been given a barbiturate and they're coming out of the general anesthesia and they're in excruciating pain, that's that hypersensitivity to pain they may have, may be experiencing, might have more to do with the barbiturate than the actual surgery. And then we already talked about the respiratory depression. So if no, uh, no if, if depressants are not combined, meaning they're being used alone, then the barbiturates are the only ones that are likely to cause respiratory depression. However, if you combine two or more depressants, 
then you lose that protection, which means the chloride ion channels stay open and they can potentially end up with a fatal overdose secondary to respiratory depression. So that's if you're combining your benzodiazepines with alcohol, your barbiturates with alcohol, your barbiturates with your benzodiazepines, as well as antihistamines. Antihistamines um, and opioids we could throw in there. It's a kind of, a, we haven't talked about those yet, but if you add all those, any of those together, you can be in seriously hot water pretty quickly. And people really should be aware of that, especially Especially, in my opinion, the combination of the, barbit the benzos, because they're used so frequently for conditions like anxiety and sleep, which are also um, conditions where people tend to self-medicate with alcohol. I mean, that's sort of the truth. People who are anxious oftentimes say, oh, I'll have a couple drinks, and that kind of takes away the anxiety. And the reason why it takes away the anxiety is because it depresses the brain, right? It's a central nervous system depressant that's the it's not doing anything for the anxiety right um and same thing with sleep right some people it's not out out of the realm of possibility for people to have a couple drinks before they go to bed right most of, of, not i don't know if i should say most but a lot of people um consume alcohol in the evening right it relaxes them take the edge off or however you want to put it but then if they're also taking benzodiazepines um that can really be a problem all right this is just showing us the kind of linear relationship between dose and degree of depression. So as you increase the dose, you're going to see first relieving anxiety, then sedation, then hypnosis. This is where why we my most people take benzodiazepines. You can lose consciousness, right? All of them can cause a loss of consciousness. But then you see the line changing from gray and orange to just orange, as we increase the dose of the barbiturate, we're going to see an inc a continual increase in, um, in depression, getting to the brainstem, depressing the respiratory center, causing death. All right, so here's our cautions additive, which means if you combine them, they're going to have additive effects, meaning you're going to get more likely to get that medullary depression and potentially death. They are commonly abused. They are both psychological and physical dependence causing agents. They are very hard to come off of for a lot of people. The withdrawal state, like I said, is the most severe and might have to be managed inpatient. It's most people are not able to go cold turkey from taking these medications, especially if they've been on them for a while. Um, the symptoms, the withdrawal symptoms can last, you know, weeks generally, but even longer than six weeks and up into like the multiples of months for some patients. Some patients can't get off of them. Um, again, the anxiety, agitation, that kind of thing seems to be some of the most common withdrawal symptoms. Okay, so I feel like we've kind of covered here, but this again is the deal with overdose. The main cause of overdose, again, is respiratory depression. I talked about why that happens. And again, the benzos are less likely to be fatal in overdose if they're used alone. But if we combine them with any other depressant, including alcohol, including antihistamines, including opioids, any of them, we're going to potentially have this fatal overdose scenario. All right. Um, in the case of the benzos, there is a drug called thumazanil, which is a competitive antagonist for the benzodiazepines. And it can be used if there's been an overdose of a benzo or, if, or after spinal anesthesia. So that's a good thing to know. All right. Um, okay, for some reason I put this slide twice. <laughs> there you have it. Let's see. Oh, okay. I think I know why I put this because I wanted to also talk about alcohol. So alcohol is another thing we want to be cautious about. It's a sedative hypnotic. And of course, we want to avoid alcohol intake in excess always, but definitely alcohol during pregnancy. So just a little bit on that. Um, you can see that as little as two ounces of alcohol during pregnancies increases someone's chance of, of a child with birth defects. 
Um, there's been some evidence showing that women with three or more drinks daily are at two to three times the risk of aborting their fetus as a woman that has less than one drink per day. You know, any alcohol seems has been correlated with increased rates of miscarriage. And the other thing that we worry about is fetal alcohol syndrome, which is characterized by CNS dysfunction, usually low IQ and a, and, and a small head. That's what microcephaly is. And you can see that on the picture, that little guy there. They tend to have growth retardation. They have facial abnormalities. Their eyes tend to be kind of close. Their ears tend to be kind of low. Um, their their uh, tongues sort of protrude, pretty common with fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, sometimes you'll see a cleft palate. We don't see that there, but that's kind of a classic uh, symptom of or sign of fetal alcohol syndrome. Uh, their immune system is subpar. Um, you can see the population. Uh, one, the, the important stat there is one in three infants of alcoholic mothers develop fetal alcohol syndrome. And you can see the smallest amount reported associated with the syndrome is 2.5 ounces and, uh, or 75 mils. A glass of wine contains about 15 mils or 0.5 ounces. So, you know, again, with pregnant women, the rule of thumb is always avoid everything you can if you can. And alcohol should be something on that list for sure. But a drink every once in a while is probably not going to be that big of a deal. Um, but again, you know, not habitually and certainly not in excess. Um, another thing that alcohol does, not necessarily related to fetal alcohol syndrome, but it causes um, atrophy of vermis, which is basically cerebellar atrophy. So they have some issues and that's quite common with alcoholics. Okay, um, I'm going to stop this video here because I think it's been kind of long and I'm going to come back and talk about general anesthesia and degree of depression.